Part Seven, Chapter Two, and Concluding Remarks of the Kama Sutra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Kama Sutra by Vatsyayana, Part Seven, Chapter Two of the ways of exciting desire and miscellaneous experiments and recipes. If a man is unable to satisfy a hastini, or elephant woman, he should have recourse to various means to excite her passion. At the commencement he should rub her yoni with his hand or fingers, and not begin to have intercourse with her until she becomes excited or experiences pleasure. This is one way of exciting a woman or he may make use of certain apadravyas, or things which are put on or around the lingam to supplement its length or its thickness, so as to fit it to the yoni. In the opinion of Bravhavya, these apadravyas should be made of gold, silver, copper, iron, ivory, buffalo's horn, various kinds of wood, tin or lead, and should be soft, cool, provocative of sexual vigour, and well fitted to serve the intended purpose. Vatsyayana, however, says that they may be made according to the natural liking of each individual. The following are the different kinds of apadravyas. 1. The armlet, valaya, should be of the same size as the lingam, and should have its outer surface made rough with globules. 2. The couple, sangati, is formed of two armlets. 3. The bracelet, chudaka, is made by joining three or more armlets until they come up to the required length of the lingam. 4. The single bracelet is formed by wrapping a single wire around the lingam according to its dimensions. 5. The kanduka or jalaka is a tube open at both ends, with a hole through it, outwardly rough and studded with soft globules, and made to fit the side of the yoni and tied to the waist. When such a thing cannot be obtained, then a tube made of the wood-apple, or tubular stalk of the bottle gourd, or a reed made soft with oil and extracts of plants, and tied to the waist with strings, may be made use of, as also a row of soft pieces of wood tied together. The above are the things that can be used in connection with, or in the place of the lingam. The people of the southern countries think that true sexual pleasure cannot be obtained without perforating the lingam, and they therefore cause it to be pierced like the lobes of the ears of an infant pierced for earrings. Now when a young man perforates his lingam he should pierce it with a sharp instrument, and then stand in water so long as the blood continues to flow. At night he should engage in sexual intercourse, even with vigour, so as to clean the hole. After this he should continue to wash the hole with decoctions, and increase the size by putting into it small pieces of cane, and the Ritea antidysenterica, and thus gradually enlarging the orifice. It may also be washed with licorice mixed with honey, and the size of the hole increased by the fruit stalks of the Simapatra plant. The hole should be anointed with a small quantity of oil. In the hole made in the lingam a man may put apadravyas of various forms, such as the round, the round on one side, the wooden mortar, the flower, the armlet, the bone of the heron, the goad of the elephant, the collection of eight balls, the lock of hair, the place where four roads meet, and other things named according to their forms and means of using them. All these apadravyas should be rough on the outside according to their requirements. The ways of enlarging the lingam must be now related. When a man wishes to enlarge his lingam, he should rub it with the bristles of certain insects that live in trees, and then, after rubbing it for ten nights with oils, he should again rub it with the bristles as before. By continuing to do this, a swelling will be gradually produced in the lingam, and he should then lie on a cot, and cause his lingam to hang down through a hole in the cot. After this, he should take away all the pain from the swelling by using cool concoctions. The swelling, which is called sukha, and is often brought about among the people of the Dravida country, lasts for life. If the lingam is rubbed with the following things, that is, the plant Physalis flexuosa, the Shavara kandaka plant, the Jayusuka plant, 
the fruit of the eggplant, the butter of a she-buffalo, the hastri charma plant, and the juice of the vajra rasa plant, a swelling lasting for one month will be produced. By rubbing it with oil boiled in the concoctions of the above things, the same effect will be produced, but lasting for six months. The enlargement of the lingam is also effected by rubbing it, or moistening it, with oil boiled on a moderate fire, along with the seeds of the pomegranate and the cucumber, the juices of the veluca plant, the hasti sharma plant, and the eggplant. In addition to the above, other means may be learnt from experienced and confidential persons. The miscellaneous experiments and recipes are as follows. A. If a man mixes the powder of the milk-hedge plant and the kantaka plant with the excrement of a monkey, and the powdered root of the lanjalalika plant, and throws this mixture on a woman, she will not love anybody else afterwards. B. If a man thickens the juice of the fruits of the cassia fistula and the eugenia jambulana by mixing them with the powder of the soma plant, the vernonia anthomintica, the eclipta prostata, and the lohopa jahirka, and applies this composition to the yoni of a woman, and then has sexual intercourse with her, his love for her will be destroyed. C. The same effect is produced if a man has connection with a woman who has bathed in the buttermilk of a she-buffalo mixed with the powders of the gopalika plant, the banu padika plant, and the yellow amaranth. d. An ointment made of the flowers of the nauclea kadamba, the hog-plum, and the eugenia jambulana, and used by a woman, causes her to be disliked by her husband. e. Garlands made of the above flowers, when worn by the woman, produce the same effect. f. An ointment made of the fruit of the Asteracantha longifolia, or Kokulaksha, will contract the yoni of a Hastini, or elephant woman, and this contraction lasts for one night. g. An ointment made by pounding the roots of the Nolumbrium speciosum, and of the blue lotus, and the powder of the plant Physalis flexuosa, mixed with ghee and honey, will enlarge the yoni of the mrigi, or deer-woman. h. An ointment made of the fruit of the Amblica mirabolans, soaked in the milky juice of the milk-hedge plant, of the soma plant, the Calotropsis gigantea, and the juice of the fruit of the Vernonia anthomintica, will make the hair white. i. The juice of the roots of the Madayantaka plant, the yellow amaranth, the Anjanika plant, the Clitoria ternatia, and the Shlakshnaparni plant, used as a lotion, will make the hair grow. J. An ointment made by boiling the above roots in oil, and rubbed in, will make the hair black, and will also gradually restore hair that has fallen out. K. If lac is saturated seven times in the sweat of the testicle of a white horse, and applied to a red lip, the lip will become white. L. The color of the lips can be regained by means of the madayantika and other plants mentioned under I. M. A woman who hears a man playing on a reed pipe, which has been dressed with the juices of the bahupatika plant, the Taberna Montana Coronoria, the Costus Speciosus or Arabicus, the Pinus Diodora, the Euphorbia Antiquorum, the Vajra and the Kantaka plant, becomes his slave. N. If food be mixed with the fruit of the thorn-apple, or Dathura, it causes intoxication. O. If water be mixed with oil, and the ashes of any kind of grass except the kusha grass, it becomes the color of milk. p. If yellow mirabolans, the hog-plum, the shrawana plant, and the priyangu plant be all pounded together, and applied to iron pots, these pots become red. q. If a lamp, trimmed with oil extracted from the shrawana and priyangan plants, its wick being made of cloth, and the slough of the skins of snakes, is lighted, 
and long pieces of wood placed near it, those pieces of wood will resemble so many snakes. R. Drinking the milk of a white cow who has a white calf at her feet is auspicious, produces fame, and preserves life. S. The blessings of venerable Brahmins, well propitiated, have the same effect. There are also some verses in conclusion. Thus have I written in a few words the science of love, after reading the texts of ancient authors, and following the ways of enjoyment mentioned in them. He who is acquainted with the true principles of this science pays regard to Dharma, Artha, Kama, and to his own experiences, as well as to the teachings of others, and does not act simply on the dictates of his own desire. As for the errors in the science of love which I have mentioned in this work, on my own authority as an author, I have, immediately after mentioning them, carefully censured and prohibited them. An act is never looked upon with indulgence for the simple reason that it is authorized by the science, because it ought to be remembered that it is the intention of the science that the rules which it contains should only be acted upon in particular cases. After reading and considering the works of Bhavhavya and other ancient authors, and thinking over the meaning of the rules given by them, the Kama Sutra was composed, according to the precepts of Holy Writ, for the benefit of the world, by Vatsyayana, while leading the life of a religious student, and wholly engaged in the contemplation of the Deity. This work is not intended to be used merely as an instrument for satisfying our desires. A person, acquainted with the true principles of this science, and who preserves his dharma, artha, and kama, and has regard for the practices of the people, is sure to obtain the mastery over his senses. In short, an intelligent and prudent person, attending to dharma and artha, and attending to kama also, without becoming the slave of his passions, obtains success in everything that he may undertake. Concluding Remarks Thus ends, in seven parts, the Kama Sutra of Vatsyayana, which might otherwise be called a treatise on men and women, their mutual relationship, and connection with each other. It is a work that should be studied by all, both old and young. The former will find in it real truths, gathered by experience, and already tested by themselves, while the latter will derive the great advantage of learning things which some perhaps may otherwise never learn at all, or which they may only learn when it is too late, too late, those immortal words of Mirabeau, to profit by the learning. It can also be fairly commended to the student of social science and of humanity, and above all to the student of those early ideas which have gradually filtered down through the sands of time, and which seem to prove that the human nature of today is much the same as the human nature of the long ago. It has been said of Balzac, the great, if not the greatest, of French novelists, that he seemed to have inherited a natural and intuitive perception of the feelings of men and women, and has described them with an analysis worthy of a man of science. The author of the present work must have also had a considerable knowledge of the humanities. Many of his remarks are so full of simplicity and truth that they have stood the test of time, and stand out still as clear and true as when they were first written, some eighteen hundred years ago. As a collection of facts, told in plain and simple language, it must be remembered that in those early days there was apparently no idea of embellishing the work, either with a literary style, a flow of language, or a quantity of superfluous padding. The author tells the world what he knows in very concise language, without any attempt to produce an interesting story. From his facts how many novels could be written! Indeed, much of the matter contained in parts three, four, five, and six has formed the basis of many of the stories and the tales of past centuries. There will be found in part seven some curious recipes. Many of them appear to be as primitive as the book itself, but in later works of the same nature these recipes and prescriptions appear to have increased, both as regards quality and quantity. In the Anunga Runga, or the Stage of Love, mentioned at page 5 of the preface in Part 1, 
there are found no less than thirty-three different subjects for which one hundred and thirty recipes and prescriptions are given. As the details may be interesting, these subjects are described as follows. 1. For hastening the paroxysm of the woman. 2. For delaying the organs of the man. 3. Aphrodisiacs. 4. For thickening and enlarging the lingam, rendering it sound and strong, hard and lusty. 5. For narrowing and contracting the yoni. 6. For perfuming the yoni. 7. For removing and destroying the hair of the body. 8. For removing the sudden stopping of the monthly ailment. 9. For abating the immoderate appearance of the monthly ailment. 10. For purifying the womb. 11. For causing pregnancy. 12. For preventing miscarriage and other accidents. 13. For ensuring easy labor and ready delivery. 14. For limiting the number of children. 15. For thickening and beautifying the hair. 16. For obtaining a good black color to it. 17. For whitening and bleaching it. 18. For renewing it. 19. For clearing the skin of the face from eruptions that break out and leave black spots upon it. 20. For removing the black color of the epidermis. 21. For enlarging the breasts of women. 22. For raising and hardening pendulous breasts. 23. For giving a fragrance to the skin. 24. For removing the evil savor of perspiration. 25. For anointing the body after bathing. 26. For causing a pleasant smell to the breath. 27. Drugs and charms for the purposes of fascinating, overcoming, and subduing either men or women. 28. Recipes for enabling a woman to attract and preserve her husband's love. 29. Magical collyriums for winning love and friendship. 30. Prescriptions for reducing other persons to submission. 31. Filter pills and other charms. 32. Fascinating incense or fumigation. 33. Magical verses which have the power of fascination. Of the 130 recipes given, many of them are absurd, but not more perhaps than many of the recipes and prescriptions in use in Europe not so very long ago. Love filters, charms, and herbal remedies have been, in early days, as freely used in Europe as in Asia and doubtless some people believe in them still in many places. And now, one word about the author of the work, the good old sage Vatsyayana. It is much to be regretted that nothing can be discovered about his life, his belongings, and his surroundings. At the end of Part 7, he states that he wrote the work while leading the life of a religious student, probably at Benares, and while wholly engaged in the contemplation of the deity. He must have arrived at a certain age at that time, for throughout he gives us the benefit of his experience and of his opinions, and these bear the stamp of age rather than of youth. Indeed, the work could hardly have been written by a young man. In a beautiful verse of the Vedas of the Christians it has been said of the peaceful dead that they rest from their labors, and that their works do follow them. Yes, indeed, the works of men of genius do follow them and remain as a lasting treasure. And though there may be disputes and discussions about the immortality of the body or the soul, nobody can deny the immortality of genius, which ever remains as a bright and guiding star to the struggling humanities of succeeding ages. This work, then, which has stood the test of centuries, has placed Vatsyayana among the immortals, and on this and on him no better elegy or eulogy can be written than the following lines. So long as lips shall kiss, and eyes shall see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. That is the end of the Kama Sutra by Vatsyayana. Thank you for listening.